Hello and welcome to this A-Level History Unit 2 tutorial. This one focuses on the modernisation of the USSR, including both collectivisation and the five-year plans. Let's start by looking at the bigger picture of changing Bolshevik economic policies over time. One point to keep in mind here is how flexible the Bolsheviks were in terms of their economic policies. Now, despite their Marxist ideology, they did not stick rigidly to Marxist principles. Lenin, in particular, was willing to divert from these principles and adapt policies in order to suit the context that they faced. Ultimately, their ideological commitment to creating a socialist society was secondary to their immediate determination to hold on to power at all costs. In the first few months after the Bolshevik takeover, the Bolsheviks followed a policy of state capitalism. Now, this policy was improvised to meet the conditions at the time. The Bolsheviks had done a lot of thinking about how they would take power, but far less thinking about what they would do afterwards. They quickly found out that it was much easier to break up the previous form of government than to create something in its place. In those early months, Bolshevik rule was limited to the two biggest cities, Petrograd and Moscow. Outside of that, the vast majority of Russia was outside their control. Workers and peasants were already taking matters into their own hands, seizing land and taking control of their factories, and the Bolshevik government was not strong enough to restrain them at this point. Now, in this context, Lenin took a pragmatic approach, adopting a mixed economy. The Bolsheviks had an ideological commitment to nationalisation, and they quickly took control of the railway and banking networks. But knowing that they could not restrain the masses, they approved peasant land seizures and the right of workers' committees to scrutinise their managers. These were short-term measures designed to attract goodwill and support from the masses, and thereby help the Bolshevik government to survive its first days. By 1918, the Bolsheviks were in the throes of an existential struggle against their enemies, the Whites. This required a much more authoritarian economic policy, which would enable the Bolsheviks to marshal all their resources for the civil war effort. Thus, they introduced war communism, nationalising all industry and food supplies and attempting to stamp out the private market. This economic policy was much closer to the ideology of those on the left of the party, and particularly Trotsky, who saw it as a blueprint for the future of communism in Russia. War communism was a harsh economic system. Features like grain requisitioning, terror and rationing were resented by both workers and peasants alike. However, as unpopular as war communism was, ultimately the alternative a white victory was even more disliked, as they represented a return to the old order and the restoration of the privileges of the old property-owning classes. Although by 1921 the whites had been defeated, the Bolsheviks' grip on power appeared more fragile. Seven years of world war, then civil war, meant that industry was collapsing. With the whites now beaten, there was a surge of worker and peasant discontent against Bolshevik rule and the extremes of war communism. Urban strikes took hold in the cities and in the countryside, rebellions like the one in Tambov proved difficult for the Red Army to crush. This unrest was fuelled by the development of the workers' opposition faction within the party itself. Leading Bolsheviks like Kolontai and Shlyapnikov supported the urban strikes and called for an end to war communism. But the most concerning development for Lenin was the Kronstadt Rising. Now, this was a substantial armed uprising of sailors from the Kronstadt naval base, calling for an end to Bolshevik one-party rule. This episode, which Lenin described as the flash which lit up reality, brought home the severity of the situation facing the party, especially as the Kronstadt sailors had previously been strong supporters of the Bolshevik takeover.
In these circumstances, Lenin made a tactical retreat from war communism to the NEP, and this was another form of mixed economy. The so-called commanding heights of the economy, like banking and transport, remained under state control. But aspects of capitalism, such as private industry and trade, were permitted in other areas of the economy. This created a deal of discom discomfort from party members who resented having fought a civil war in the name of communism, only to end up with an economy that still resembled capitalism in some ways. Lenin reassured the 10th Party Congress in 1921 that this was a necessary but temporary pause in order to get the economy back on its feet. Now, once again, this shows how pragmatic Lenin could be, diverting away from ideology where necessary in order to hold on to power. The NEP did deliver recovery and improvements in living standards for some. But the big winners, though, were the peasantry, who were once again able to trade their surplus for profit. Now, Lenin had not given any specific date for the NEP to end. Its end was brought about by the circumstances which the party found itself in by 1928. By that point, the NEP had stalled, with the economy no longer growing. A massive injection of capital was now needed in order to continue industrialisation. The decision to end the NEP was also influenced by political factors. Stalin, by this point, was engaged in the later stages of the power struggle. And his switch from supporting the NEP to ending it was part of his strategy to outmanoeuvre Bukharin and the right and by appealing to the bulk of party members. They were impatient to build socialism and resentful of the peasants and the gains they'd made under the NEP. The war scare of 1927 had also made the need for industrialisation seem more urgent so that Russia could expand its armaments production. We should also remember that the switch to a planned economy was driven by the party's desire to strengthen its control over the countryside. By this point, the party had consolidated its power over the towns, but peasants still presented a potential threat. Their control of food production could be used as a political weapon against the government. By withholding grain, peasants could exert political pressure on the government, just as they had done to the provisional government and the Tsarist government before that. And this is what happened again in 1928 when there was a grain procurement crisis, when peasants withheld grain to try and drive up the prices. It was this that was the trigger for Stalin to begin collectivisation, which would finally bring the countryside under the Bolshevik government's control. So one common requirement for students is to evaluate the success of Stalin's modernisation. This needs to be measured against Stalin's aims. These were firstly political. Stalin's economic policies were driven by his own determination to establish himself as the undisputed leader of the USSR and to tighten his control over the USSR, particularly over rural areas. His aims were also economic. He aimed to industrialise at a much faster pace than had been the case under the NEP, turning the USSR from a predominantly agricultural country to an industrial powerhouse and thus catch up with Western countries. This in turn would increase the Soviet Union's security as it would be able to produce armaments necessary to repel invaders. Now, remember here that the USSR had been invaded by foreign powers in support of the whites during the Civil War, and that memory was still um, strong in the Bolsheviks' minds. Industrialisation would also enable the USSR to become self-sufficient in items for which it was currently dependent on the West for, like machine tools. This would allow the USSR to supply its own needs, thus making it more independent in the world and less at risk of its supplies being cut off by Western capitalist powers. All of this would help establish Stalin's credentials as a great leader, thus strengthening his position. And the same is true of his social aims. The party was impatient for the creation of a socialist society, and by delivering this, Stalin could secure his position as leader and his place in history.
Socialism should also provide a good quality of life for its people and an attractive model to other countries. So it was also important to raise living and working conditions within the USSR. So let's evaluate the success of collectivisation against those political, economic and social aims. Now, politically, collectivisation was a significant success for Stalin. The violent campaign to collectivise the peasantry conjured up memories of the heroic civil war period, which was popular with the uh, idealistic and radical party members. Engaging in a life or death struggle with the peasantry also rallied the party behind Stalin, strengthening his position. Stalin succeeded where Stalipin had failed a generation earlier by smashing the power of the peasantry. The mirrors were finally eliminated and once on the collective farms, the peasants lost their power to disrupt the food supply. All of this boosted Stalin's prestige as a great leader. There were some limitations in this area. Initially, collectivisation was met with widespread and violent resistance from the peasants. The government also struggled to establish control over local party officials too. And they often resisted the process of de-kulakization because they were unwilling to remove kulaks, um, who were frequently the most enterprising, successful farmers. However, it's important to note that these limitations were short term only. Brute force and the use of 25,000 urban volunteers overcame this resistance by the later half of the 1930s. In economic terms, the results of collectivisation were more of a mixed picture. On one hand, it was easier for the state to take grain from collectivised farms, therefore the amount of grain procured more than doubled. Now this was a substantial success because it achieved one of the main aims of collectivisation, which was to obtain enough grain to feed the cities and export abroad to earn the capital for industrialisation. Indeed, collectivisation also enabled industrialisation in other ways too, as it created a surplus of peasant labour, which was not needed in the countryside. And these peasants migrated to urban areas, becoming the necessary labourers for expanding industries. Nevertheless, though the amount of grain taken by the state increased, the total harvest itself dropped substantially as a result of the loss of the best farmers and the poorly equipped machine and tractor stations. Peasants also resisted the process by eating their livestock, which led to a substantial drop in meat and milk production, and that didn't recover for a decade. And while collectivisation provided capital for industrialisation, the production of farm machinery sapped resources which could otherwise have been invested in industrial technology. The social impact of collectivisation was significant. It ended land hunger, and that was one of the major social problems that previous Russian regimes had been unable to tackle. Furthermore, it went some way towards creating a more socialist society, as it promoted substantial growth in the size of the urban proletariat, and a more socialist form of communal living and farming in the countryside, especially on the Sovkhozes, where peasants were effectively treated like workers paid a wage to work on state-owned farms. Yet the failures in this area were particularly significant. The most common type of collective farm was actually the coal cos. But peasants on these farms retained small private plots of land, which they used to grow vegetables and keep livestock, selling these to supplement their income. Thus, the private market was not completely eradicated. The drop in meat and milk production led to a decline in urban living standards and the upheaval of collectivisation led to a devastating famine, particularly in Ukraine. Now, although some historians like Robert Conquest have argued that this famine was politically beneficial to Stalin, as it was a weapon with which to weaken Ukrainian nationalism, nevertheless, it also demonstrates the failure of the socialist agricultural system to provide a better quality of life for its people in this period. Next, we'll turn to industrialisation and the five year plans. First, let's compare and contrast the three five year plans in this period. Each plan was shaped by its own context. 
In the case of the first five year plan, its introduction was a response to the slowdown of the NEP and the impatience of the party to build socialism. Stalin was responsive to the mood of the party and he adopted the policy of a planned economy as part of his successful outmanoeuvring of Bukharin and the right. The priorities of the second five year plan were shaped partly by the mistakes and weaknesses of the first and by the pressure coming from within the Politburo by moderates like Kirov, who wanted to slow the pace and intensity of industrialisation down in order to focus more on providing a better standard of living for workers. The third five year plan took place at the height of the terror, during which party members, officials, managers and the ordinary population were being purged. This included the moderates who had previously urged a slower pace of industrialisation. The urgency of industrialisation increased once more as rearmament by Hitler created fears about imminent war with Germany. Now, despite their different contexts, all three plans shared a number of common features. Ultimately, all focused on heavy industry, which was seen to have driven industrial revolutions elsewhere in Europe. All prior prioritised the quantity of goods produced rather than the quality of those goods. The plans all had a propaganda angle, thus they were completed one year early and focused on vast industrial projects to emphasise the superiority of the socialist system. Across all three plans, workers and managers were driven to greater efforts by tough discipline measures and through and through the fear of being denounced as wreckers if they did not. Since the fear of failure was so pervasive, corruption was rife, and those who did fall foul of the purges provided a source of slave labour for the most labour intensive aspects of the plans, like for example, cutting timber or constructing canals. Yet each plan had its own unique features too. The first had the most unrealistic targets because rival state agencies, Gosplan and Vesenka, competed with each other to set the most ambitious quotas for production. The second five year plan tried to rectify this with more detailed planning and better training schemes. There was a greater focus on consumer goods, at least for the first two years of the plan, and more attempts to provide workers with incentives for production through the Stakhanovite movement. The third five-year plan was characterised by its strong focus on armaments production and the increased severity of its discipline measures, with labour books and internal passports introduced to try and stabilise the labour force, preventing workers moving from one region to another. The planning itself was the most chaotic of all, as the purges created a shortage of administrators and planners. Now, once again, the success of the plans should be measured against the political, economic and social goals of the regime. In political terms, the plans were a resounding success. Introduction of the planned economy proved Stalin's credentials as a great leader, rallying the left wing of the party behind him. The party itself gained unprecedented control over both the economy and society, both of which helped to establish a totalitarian authoritarian state. Furthermore, the production figures, regardless of their accuracy or the quality of production, demonstrated the success of the planned economy and thus served as propaganda for the regime. Of course, there was concern among moderates within the party at the pace and violence of industrialisation, but this challenge to Stalin was short lived. Economically, the picture is more mixed. Now, there's no doubt that production did rise with spectacular growth in heavy industry, where some areas tripled or doubled in output. Indeed, whole new industrial areas like Magnitogorsk were brought into being and massive projects like the Moscow Metro improved infrastructure. Yet the focus on targets and the fear of missing them led to competition between managers as they competed for labourers, 
Skilled workers could benefit from this competition by moving between jobs in order to, to uh, obtain a better deal, which destabilised industry. Ex-peasants arriving in the cities provided a source of labour, but this was unskilled and frequently slow production by damaging machinery. At any rate, much of what, what was produced was of poor quality. For example, steel that was so low grade that it couldn't be used for anything, or tyres which burst after just a few miles on the road. And while heavy industry did grow quickly, consumer goods declined, with the exception of a brief improvement during the second five-year plan. Now, if the aim of modernisation was to deliver a more socialist society and a better quality of living, the plans only partially achieved their goals. The end of the NEP and the nationalisation of all industry did mean the end of the private market. For some, there were more opportunities to better their quality of life, and this was particularly the case for skilled workers who could obtain better deals, increased pay and bonuses. Stakhanovites too were rewarded for exceeding their targets by receiving extra privileges and perks. Yet these sorts of bonuses contradicted the principle of equality, which was central to socialism. And they undermined the stability of society too, as workers were constantly on the move from one workplace to another, not staying long enough to develop skills. Mosh Lewin calls this a quicksand society. The emphasis on rapid industrialisation rather than health and safety or sanitation led to a deterioration of working condi conditions for the urban workforce. And the plans didn't create a worker's paradise either, as workers' rights were curtailed and the lack of focus on consumer goods led to lower living standards. At all levels, workers and managers suffered under increased pressure to meet targets or face being purged. So if you'd like to practice applying the knowledge in this video, here are three questions that you could have a go at. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. There you'll find plenty more videos to accompany the A-Level History course.